Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. A cult classic among fans, being the very first adaptation of the card game, releasing one year before the anime and the TCG itself. Forbidden Memories was not restrained to any master rules, with tributes, special summons, and heck, even card effects not even being a thing. Aside from rituals, which let's face it, nobody could ever pull off. Instead, Monster Cards adopted a very simple formula of having attack points, defense points, a type, and of course, the Yu-Gi-Oh equivalent of a damn zodiac sign, because god forbid people need any more of an excuse to enact violence on one another. Anywho, one other nifty feature, and your main win condition, is the fusion mechanic, in which you select a variety of different monster types, and fuse them together to form a more powerful beast. Forbidden Memories has a massively memorable pool of fusions, all of which are an absolute necessity if you have any chance of beating this game. Most notable fusions are Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, and of course, Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon with 4 equipped cards. But this got me thinking, is it possible to beat the game relying only on a single monster type? Let's go over the rules. Number 1. A deck must consist of only a single monster type. Number 2. Trading and trade cloning are allowed. Number 3. The star chip trader aka the password machine is allowed. Number 4. The story cannot commence till we have a monotype deck built for us. And lastly, all our opponents must be dueled. No skipping Seto third or our old mate Simon. And with that being said, let's get right into it. The card type we selected for this run will be the dinosaur type. Forbidden Memories has a total of 13, yes that's right, 13 dinosaur cards out of the entire 722 card library. Only 7 of which are made available to you in the starting deck. It is safe to say, we have our work cut out for us. Starting a new game, we get a chance to enter a name for our dinosaur protagonist. I chose to name him after none other than Rex, the Metal Gear Mad Lad himself, hoping he will bring us some much needed luck for our starting deck. We're gonna need it. Anywho, after skipping the absolutely unnecessarily long starting sequence, we're greeted by our best friend, Blue Popo, who, like everyone else in our immediate family, is ashamed that us for playing card games, and feels the need to inform us that we should be ashamed too. So how do we deal with this? Simple. We just run away. With control given back to us, we make our way to the card shop. When it eventually loads, because this is a PlayStation 1 game, we have a chance to now build our deck. By build deck, I mean see if we've landed any dinosaur cards. Scrolling down, we can see that Rex smiled favourably on us and has given us the strongest card we can probably get in our starting deck, Uravi. Flashback to Uravi Turbo from Master Rule 1. Those of you around there know exactly what I'm talking about. Anywho, once we've had a look at our deck, all we can really see from the Equip and Magic department is that we've gotten the card Rageki. Standard, solid card that we need in every single deck we make moving forward. Quitting out to the card menu, we now need to save our game to record the deck we just got. Easy does it now. Not too fast PlayStation 1. Okay. With deck number 1 saved, we now need to quit out to the main menu and repeat this entire, entire process for memory card 2. That includes the intro sequence with Haitian. Fun stuff right there. Let me just do a jump cut to save you all some time. Okay, skipping ahead. We now select the trade option and send everything we've obtained from deck 2 across to deck 1. We repeat this process, albeit several freaking times, till we have 3 copies of each dinosaur card, 3 copies of each field spell, and 3 copies of each equip card, all available in the initial starter deck list. We'll need to pad the numbers of the initial deck by about 19 cards to make up for the lack of dinosaurs. This keeps things in line with our main rule. And here we are, here's our 40 card dinosaur deck. Ranging all the way from Anthrosaurus to Urabi, a few Ragekis, a few Dark Holes, and a bunch of equip cards to pad the rest of the deck. We're now ready to start the adventure. After gaining control of our character and changing our background track, we now exit the card shop and make our way back to Simon with our completed dinosaur deck. After some more smack talk from the blue m and he decides that he wants to fool around and find out if we're really serious about this, and proceeds to challenge us to a duel. We start things off hard and strong by putting our little D down on the field. This has him cowering in fear, and presents himself face down to us in turn 2. With a big brain move in mind, I decide to fuse a dragon treasure with a horn of the unicorn, and then drop a Urabi onto the field. Urabi is basically our win condition for the majority of the duels we're going to face at the start of this game. So anyways, I decided to just skip ahead to the very end because there isn't much to say about this duel. Simon's strongest card is Exodia, and that's his main win condition. So with that being said, 
we land ourselves our first win against Simon. After earning Uncle Simon's praise, we exit the Ferris Palace and make our way down to the little ground. It is here that we're met by Tina. No, not Taya. This is Tina. The anime had not existed at this point. So anywho, she decides to challenge us to a duel. She is actually weaker than Simon by a wide margin. Her strongest monster is literally Shadow Spectre, with a measly 500 attack points and 200 defense points. Like the previous duel, there isn't much to really say, so I'll save everyone the hassle and skip ahead. For those unfamiliar with this game, the field is now a brown color because I used the field spell card Wasteland. This powers up all dinosaur monsters by an additional 500 points. Not really needed for the start of the game, but may prove useful to us as we go along. Anywho, we beat Tina without a problem, and yeah, there's our win condition right there. So there are a number of other duelists that we have here in the dueling grounds. They don't really give us anything useful, none of them drop any additional dinosaur cards that we require. So beating them is just a matter of formality just to keep things in line with the first rule. First rule? No, fifth rule. Whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about. Duel every opponent, etc, etc. You've noticed that I've basically rammed from this point. It's because that there's nothing really that any of these villagers can do. Villager 1? Pretty weak, uh, to say the least. Things really only get tested when we move across to Villager 2, and then Villager 3. And by test that I mean that they actually have the basic ability of fusing cards together. So I think the strongest monster that we're going to probably face from this point on is Guy the Fierce Knight at about 2,300 attack points. I think it's 2,300. Yeah, anyways, we'll figure it out. Anyways, where were we? Yep, Raigeki, Bam, Bam, and Final Bam. And there we go. There's Villager 1 down, and he gives us Bone Mouse. With Villager 1 down, we now make our way to Villager 2. Villager 2 is a tricky opponent at the start of the game, usually blindsiding a lot of new players. As mentioned, he has the basic brain capacity to actually fuse monsters together. His go-to fusion is usually Pumpkin, with his deck being made of a lot of zombie cards and plant cards, but will also have a chance to summon Mystic Sand, Flame Cerberus, and usually Garvis. And another sneaky fact about this guy, he will randomly have a 1 in 2000 chance to summon a Gumo. Gumo is an insect type card with a whopping 2200 attack points. Not wanting to take any chances, I decide to use a Wasteland just to give myself an extra 500 attack point boost. Fortunately for this duel, there isn't much to say. I end up pretty lucky. He doesn't summon any of those big beaters. I think he attempts to fuse one or two times, but overall, you know, I just had the better cards. Having a basic Raigeki or a Dark Hole usually sets you up pretty well for the starting part of the game. And going by what he's decided to place face down, he hasn't actually accessed any of his stronger cards um, in his deck list. There we go. Like we said before, Raigeki is our win condition, leaving him open to a final attack. And there we go, we won. We won a turtle. We can't use a turtle. With this guy aside, we move across the village of three. Now, mixed reviews on this guy. Some say he's a bit broken, some say he's not. But really, for this run, I didn't have much of a hard time against him. I just start things off the same way. A dinosaur, and whatever equip cards I seem to have in my hand. Villager 3 deck list is a bit more advanced than his predecessors. He has more Thunder and Dragon cards, so he genuinely has the ability to pull out a twin-headed Thunder Dragon on you if you're not careful. Aside from that, from a single card perspective, his strongest solo monster is Dragon Zombie at 1600 attack points. So, we've covered ourselves pretty well in having a few equip cards in our starting turn. Nothing we have on the field you know, is really left at mercy to any of his cards. If he does decide to summon something strong, we have more than enough equip cards to just out-damage it in the long run. There isn't much to say here, he doesn't really pull any magic out of his backside. We just run a Raigeki and attack for the win. And there we go. Da -da -da, you win, and we get the left arm of the Forbidden One. Didn't even know he dropped that. He seems cranky. Anywho, we decide to talk to someone else. Realising we have no friends, we decide to go outside to try and make some. It is here that the game reminds us that it has a story, by showing us an Egyptian Mardi Gras. Fading to black, we now witness history's only recorded interaction between a bogan and a rabbi. This blank-faced sicky butt brain here is Jono. He is upset because the rabbi took his last light instead of buying his own from the servo. After refusing to give it back, he tries to challenge us to a duel before legging it out the back, never to be seen again. Fading to black, I think now is a good time to make a safety save, because a single game over in this game means game over. We start again from the start. Not saving from up to this point was probably a bit of a risky thing on my end. 
Anywho, back to the door ground. Oi! Oi, Rex! That rabbi bloke stole me liner! Could, could you bum one off for you, mate? With Jono's eloquent use of the English language, he decides that he wants to challenge us to a duel, hoping that he can borrow a lighter off us should he be successful. Start things off strong, dropping a Eurabia onto the field with three equip cards. Jono's deck isn't really that threatening. I find he's probably a bit stronger than Villager 1, but a bit shy from being at Villager 2 level. The strongest card he can make is Thousand Dragon, given that he has both a Baby Dragon and a Time Wizard in his deck. From a solo card perspective, Baby Dragon again is his strongest single card. So there really isn't nothing much to write home about because Eurabia's at 1500 attack points, which is at least around more than his 1200. That aside, the duel goes about exactly as you always expect. There we go, Raigeki for the win, and bam, 1500. There we go, we win, and we get an Air Nomad of Nefariousness. Oi Rex, why'd you go and beat me in the game for your dog? Oh look, he's back! And he wants me on the liner! Prince Seto, having used up all of Jono's first lighter, has come back to challenge us for ours. There isn't much to say about Seto. He's a relatively strong opponent and probably the first gatekeeper to this game if you chose to skip all the villagers. Seto's strongest card in his deck is Guy the Fierce Knight, which usually starts with on turn 1. We just happen to get lucky and not get it, which works great for us. Seto's strongest in his deck would be Battle Locks at 1700 attack points, but Seto also has some good AI where he can fuse monsters into something stronger. The strongest thing he will usually summon on you would probably be Flame Cerberus at 2100 attack points. Anywho, with that aside, he drops a Lajin, Magical Genie, who happens to be stronger than the second monster we had on the field. But now that we have our Eurabia powder for 2500 attack points, he really doesn't have anything that's gonna, you know, throw a spanner in the works. The only other card he has that can challenge us is Dark Hole. He keeps a Dark Hole and the Yami in his deck which lets him boost up any of his other monsters and wipe out the board if things start looking dicey. Rambling aside, yeah, this is it. Not much of a gatekeeper with this dino deck, so we seem to be going strong, being the main prologue of the game. Well, for now. Da -da -da -da, we got Skellengel. Prince Seto, being unsuccessful in his attempt to obtain a lighter, asks for our name and then properly leaves the building. Both Jono and Tina are in a celebratory mood after we thwarted Seto's efforts to steal our lighter. The game rewards us a second time by letting us go outside. Back to the card shop, we save our game. As you can probably hear from my voice, I've decided to catch a cold midway through recording, so, you know, good luck listening to that for the rest of the video. Returning back to the main screen, we go back to the Pharaoh's Palace, where the blue M&M whisks us back to our room having had enough of us. He then broods in his office for a while. We hear some rumbling and we find out that the palace has been absolutely trashed by none other than a pimp named Jafar, who flexes and puts Blue Boy in his place with his magic stick. This rouses us out of our bedroom, so we run out and bump into Seto and his gang of merry coneheads. Seto confronts us, steals one of our servants, and drags us outside. Not wanting to be left alone, Papa Smurf joins us and decides that he wants to flex on us by showing us his gold pyramids. He then babbles a bunch of things and tells us to run away which happens to be our default response every time we see him. We bump into a pimp named Jafar, yes we have to say the whole thing, who decides to challenge us to our first unwinnable tool. It is here that I decide to try my luck and see if I can actually make some progress with this guy with our current starting deck. Spoiler alert, short answer is no. Though I have every equip card and every dinosaur made available to us from the start of the game, I lack the raw power to do any real damage. The strongest attack starting monster we have is 1500, which is a joke, it's nothing. Though we have a lot of nice equip cards, we're missing some staple cards like Megamorph, Widespread Ruin, and even Bright Castle for able to land those drops later on in the game. I know ahead of time I'm going to have to grind a bit more when we reach all the Desert Mages, and even some of the final opponents of the tournament that we're about to come up to. Anyways, with that being said, epic foreshadowing that we're going to get our butt kicked, we decide to lose to Hessian, because the decision's not ours. Whether you win or whether you lose, it keeps throwing you back in this duel to lose. Winner, a pimp named Jafar. At the end of the duel, the blue mighty bean grabs a pimp named Jafar and asks us if we want to smash or pass. Not wanting to waste a good opportunity, we decide to smash his box. Screen fades to white, and this is the last interaction we have with this soggy toilet roll. Snap back to reality, we wake up and find out it was all a dream. Pretty anticlimactic. This is Joey, not Jono. Our main character is Yugi, not the prince. We have a tournament. It wouldn't be Yugi without a tournament. Skipping half the announcer dialogue and everyone else's dialogue, Seto comes on screen, sorry, 
Kyber. Kyber comes on screen with an open shirt. Skip ahead to the card shop where we save our game with Taya. That's right, I said Taya and not Tina. Tina is from Egypt, and Egypt is a myth. Fiddling with the analog stick like some sort of coked up amputee, we reach our first duel in the prelims against our rival and our mentor, Rex. Opponents in this part of the game will start to rely more heavily on fusions. In Rex's case, for someone that is a dinosaur duelist, he has a lot of cards and a lot of fusions that aren't freaking dinosaurs. So with that being said, I feel we are the superior duelist and we're going to absolutely wipe the floor with him. This duel is a relatively free duel for us. Rex doesn't make any attempt to make any fusions. And the strongest card he has solo in his deck is Eurabi, which, you know, we have our own Eurabi, so it's really Eurabi versus Eurabi. Like the good old days. If Rex had good AI, his deck is designed around bringing out Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon and Flame Cerberus. But, given that this is really the first duel in the prelims, they don't up the difficulty too much. He'd probably be on par with Seto, or even Villager 3. Anywho, with that being said, we attack the game and we wait for our card to drop. And he's on now. Which in this case, our drop is duh, 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 Monster Egg. With Rex being absolutely humiliated by a superior Dino Duelist, we exit back to the Taya shop and save our game. Rather than continuing, it is here that we exit back out to the main menu and access the free duel function. Having Rex unlocked in the free duel, we now have access to two new dinosaur cards, Twin Headed King Rex and Crawling Dragon number 2 both at 1600 attack points apiece and available with S rank or A power ranks. Rather than bore you with the repetitive duels against Rex, I'm just going to jump cut ahead where I drop both Twin Headed King Rex and Crawling Dragon number 2. Utilising some player 2 shenanigans, we obtain 3 copies of both cards, update our deck and jump right back into the action for our next duel against Weevil. Weevil is not overly difficult as an opponent, especially with our slightly upgraded deck being able to creep monsters well over 2000 attack. His deck is a noticeable upgrade from Rex's. The attack power per single card starts from 1000 upwards, and his strongest card is Dragoma at 2200 attack points. Pretty solid from that point. In our case, when we duel him, we don't really encounter any of his heavy hitters, with the exception of that Cocoon of Evolution with 2000 defense points. The rest of the duel goes pretty much as you'd expect. He doesn't attempt any fusions, despite having the ability to pull out both Black Dragon Jungle King and Crimson Sunbird, and his deck doesn't really have any equip cards or magic cards. Absolutely zero in that fact, so there's nothing he really has that can deal with our board. So, with all those things aside, we take him out. Just as soon as we wait for his turn to end and our final turn to begin. Sorry, there's no real way I can speed this up, this is the last turn. For any longer duels, I think I would just jump cut ahead. Anywho, da -da -da -da, we get a big insect. Just the one. There we go, nothing much to say, Weevil is down, and we save our game. Our next opponent is Mai. Mai's AI is a leagues better than Weevil, in that she will actually use equip cards to boost her monsters directly after fusing into them. She likes to throw out Harpy's Feather Duster and Spellbinding Circle if the RNG decides that it wants to slap you in the face. She's programmed to specifically fuse into high power female monsters like Dark Elf, Mystic Sand and Harpy Lady Sisters. The power of her card pool as well has also increased, having more single cards between 1800 and 2000 attack power. The strongest card is Harpy's Pet Dragon, but only at 2000 attack. You've noticed that I'm somewhat rambling and giving a lot of details during this duel. Strictly put, I'm just trying to pad out some time, because everything that I've mentioned ahead of this, she hasn't done it. Her AI is on holidays. We've been granted another free duel, and honestly, not much to say. To compensate for this, Mai at least gives us some pretty good drops after we unlock her in the free duel gallery. If we're able to S-Tech crank her, we'll get access to Spellbinding Circle, Harpy's Feather Duster, Acid Trap Hole, and I think Soul of the Pure, which when fused together makes Dion Keta the Cure Master, a pretty handy recovery card. She also dropped Twin Headed King Rex, even though we don't need it. Anywho, let's save our game. Next up, we have Bandit Keith. Keith gets mixed reviews on my end with regards to his difficulty. He will run up fusions with ranges between 1800 to 2100 attack points, but he has limited equip cards that they can actually use. So in a 360 no scope middle finger to us, the game will randomly decide to let him fuse into Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, which has a whopping 2800 attack points. If that wasn't enough, the RNG can really punch us in the throat by stacking his deck to fuse into Metal Zoa. Fortunately for us, Bandit Keith was just going easy on us this duel. Um, honestly, as easy as all the other opponents we've faced thus far. All of them genuinely seem to struggle with field spells this early on. 
None of them really have their own, so they can't really count on the wasteland we've dropped at the start of the door. Anywho, nothing much to say here. We beat Bandit Keith, and the game rewards us with more unskippable story. Just as soon as we skip ahead to our final turn. Here we go. Raigeki for the win. Good old Raigeki. Nothing beats it. And we win... Wood Remains. Okay, we're going to absolutely speed through this next section. Let's go. We bump into Joey. We bump into Shardy. Shardy asks us to touch him. We joyfully do. We meet our past self. He gives us some Visa gift cards. Back to Joey. Back to Shardy. Back to the gift cards. Shardy. Joey. Duel time. Let's go. Shardy is an absolute pushover of a duelist. There is nothing in his deck that can really devastate you. If you lose to Shardy, you suck at this game. And you need to start again from the start or just return it. Seriously, this is a free duel. There is no reason why this one should be difficult for you. He doesn't really give you any good drops either if you do decide to go back and tech rank him or power rank him. If you really want, you can get access to some of the trap cards like Eat Gaboon or Bear Trap, but they're not really going to carry you through the game. He does give you access to Eternal Drought if you're really struggling against the high mages later on, but really it's only going to help you against one. Anywho, I'm rambling. Raigeki for the win. Attack for the win. And da -da 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 -da. what does this blood give us? Skata, needle ball. Thank you, no thank you, you're crap, go home. And we steal your scales. Shamefully, we do have to go back and save our game because I'm not sitting through that cutscene again if we lose. There we go. Saved, on to the next duel. Up next is Yami Bakura. He isn't too tough of an opponent, but he runs a lot of high defense monsters. He will almost always start the duel by dropping either a Labyrinth Wall or a Millennium Shield. Having a couple of equip cards or a Raigeki is a must if you want to beat him. As for everything else, his level cap is about 2000 attack for monsters and has the same fusing ability as his previous opponents. Fun fact, if you haven't realized it by now, I'm prone to making mistakes. Being the mixed that I am, I ended up using Wasteland thinking that it will power up just my dinosaur monsters, forgetting that it also powers up his Labyrinth Wall which I ended up attacking myself with. Big brain move right there. Anywho, stupidity aside, there's not much to say here. It's an easy win. Defeating Bakura grants us access to farm Acid Trap Hole, Warrior Elimination, and for those absolute massacres out there, the Crush Card, albeit at a 0.1% drop rate if you happen to S-Tech him in Free Duel. Unrelated, he also drops almost every Ritual card for some strange reason, so... I don't know, for those of you that actually know how to use Ritual monsters or like playing with them for some odd reason, he's the guy you should be farming off. I will say that if you're seeking some better trap cards, it's not a good idea to farm them off Yami Bakura. We're going to be going up against Pegasus than Isis. Um, they have better drop tables if you happen to S-Tech them. On top of that, I think with Isis you can S... No, you can B, C and D power rank her, and she'll also drop some good cards. Anywho, we win some tenderness. Much loved. And we steal his necklace. Mine. Alright, we're going to go save our game, and on to the next door. Moving along, we're up to our favourite flamboyant 24-year-old. Yes, he was 24 during Duelist Kingdom. Deal with it. He's much stronger than all our prior opponents. He will start each duel with either summoning a Bakuri box or a Crimson Sunbird fusion at 2300 attack. And at other times, he'll decide to slap your shit right up by dropping a Media Black Dragon at 3500 attack. He also has access to several Raigekis, Harpy's Feather Dusters, and a few other annoying trap cards. And he isn't really that scared to use them. Fortunately against us, we have a pretty easy run. The only thing we had to deal with was a Faceless Mage running us at 2200 defense points. Defeating him unlocks the ability for us to farm several great spell, trap and equip cards at the near highest drop rate if we can S10 crack him. We'll keep that in mind for later if we get stuck against the mages. For now, I'm trying to not abuse Mega Morphs and Bright Castles this early in the game. We'll see if we need to use them when we come up to the final 7. Anywho, we won and we get a Wicked Dragon with an Arat's head. Ersat's head? I can't pronounce it. We steal his eye. And there we go. Saving our game. Our next duel is against Bleep. We can't say Bleep's name because we'll get our video banned from YouTube. She has a decent deck, running lots of Aqua, Thunder and Sea Serpent monsters, and is actually smart enough as an AI to use the field spell Umi if she draws it. Strangely, both her deck and AI is stacked for her to spam Swords of Revealing Light making her a really slow fight in some cases. Fortunately, wasn't the case for us. We didn't draw it. Bleep is also the only duelist in the game that can drop Widespread Ruin, a really handy trap card, using only a B, C or D power rank. 
instead of an S tech rank like everyone else, which is a very useful utility card for us. Again, I'll start farming for that later in the game when things start getting tougher, but it's always handy to know that we have someone that we don't have to actually S tech rank to get some good cards off. I'm rambling on again because this is another slow duel. There isn't much to say. We pretty much beat her without much trouble, save for that Aqua Dragon we dealt with at the start. Her deck also has a 0.5% chance to drop Black Skull Dragon on us. I've never seen her actually do it, but according to the deck list and the game notes, she can do it. So yeah, have fun with that if you're that unlucky. Anywho, Raigeki for game, bam. And what do we win? Da 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 da. Hido check, kak, kak, whatever it is, I can't read. Anywho, she's cranky, we stole her choker. Mine. And we save our game. We're up to the last fight of the finals. Fighting Kaiba seems more intimidating than it actually is, simply because he has a 2.2% chance to summon Blue Eyes White Dragon, and the game RNG makes the odds feel more like 90% when you actually duel him. Kaiba's deck can also throw out Crush Card, Dark Hole, Shadow Spell, and Swords of Revealing Light at us, making him a problematic opponent if you're trying to win by attrition. Our strategy is the same as the rest. Throw down a Wasteland, confuse the AI, spam equip cards, and attack for the win. Defeating Kaiba unlocks him in free duel and grants us access to farm Acid Trap Hole and Crush Card at the increased odds of 4.1% and 1.95% respectively. Like I said during our duel with Pegasus, we'll farm those cards on an as needed basis if we find that we end up struggling against the mages and through the final six. Anywho, as you can see, I'm rambling again. Isn't much to say, so we Raigeki for the win and attack for game. Done. Da, 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 we win a Blackland Fire Dragon. Hmm, handy. We place our hands on his long, shiny Polish rod, and we take it for ourselves. Having collected enough Visa gift cards, we send the card numbers over to our Microsoft tech support representative in Egypt, who kindly offers to help us remove the malware that's infected our PC. After storing our card numbers and ID documents for quality and training purposes, our call gets disconnected, and we find ourselves back in the past. Gaining back control of our character, we take a casual stroll to the King's Valley, where we meet Sadin. No, I said it right, Sadin, not Shadi, this is Sadin. Anyways, our munted blue popo replacement casually informs us that our whole family is dead, then babbles on about needing us to find him a map to some ruins like we're on some sort of Dora the Explorer adventure. Anywho, with some questionable breaking and entering, we come up against a mage soldier who challenges us to a card game, instead of, you know, stabbing us with his spear. So back to the card games we go. Mage Soldier is a freebie. He's about as strong as the opponents you faced in the early prelims of the game. The strongest card he will actually fuse into is Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon, but you will likely defeat him by the time he pulls that off. In a free duel, he is basically useless. Though he does drop a decent set of useful traps, his drop rates are lower than that of the current opponents you can farm them from. I would only waste your time on him if you're struggling to S-Tech the other opponents. He doesn't have any disruptive spells, traps, or even any equip cards in his deck. He literally has Yami, Soul of the Pure, and Hukazi as his only three spell cards. So, he should be someone fairly simple to win against if you're trying to farm. Anywho, Raigeki for the win. Bam. And what do we get? Da -da 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 -da. Lord of the Lamp. Lamp. After beating the Vascular Mage Soldier, we continue to desecrate this deceased person's bedroom until we find the map, and then we go bring it back to Shahita. Shahita decides that he's going to fast travel us over across to this giant, random red pentagram in the sky. Being absolutely awestruck, Old Mate proceeds to stare at the wall, being the cooked lad that he is. Whilst he's doing that, we're interrupted by Seto, who informs us that a bunch of Egyptian mages have cashed in our Visa gift cards and are holding some cheeky loot over at their temples. Acting equally as fried as this bloke, we decide to stare at the wall as well to see what the fuss was about, then proceed to return back to the main area and exit to the main map. Going back to Metropolis, I forget exactly where I need to go and enter the old card shop. That does nothing at this point of the game, so I don't know why I went there. So correctly, I go to the old duel ground. We are then faced with an encounter with our old mate Siggy Butt Brain Jono, who sneaks us out the back for some durries and reintroduces us to our old friend Tina. With the gang back together, there's only one thing to do, and that is to duel. We get the choice between both Jono or Tina, both of which have improved decks from the last time we fought them. Kicking things off, we have Jono and we can see that he is vastly stronger compared to the time that we fought him before. So much so that the game decides to treat him as a completely different character and calls him Jono Second when we unlock him in Free Duel. His deck tries to mirror the cards that were used by him in the anime, giving him back his signature Red-Eyes Black Dragon. 
When we unlock him in Friedel, he lets you farm both Meteor Black Dragon and Red Eyes Black Dragon. But for the sake of this run, we can't use them. So for our purposes, he's pretty useless, unfortunately. Being cautious as we are, I decide to power up a lot of my monsters with equipped cards and run a lot of field spells. This is because I've forgotten quite literally how strong his strongest monster was in his deck. And we're just sort of trying to gear ourselves up for what's about to come when we duel a lot of the high mages. They are a lot stronger than anyone we've faced thus far. Rambling aside, we win and da -da -da -da, we get pot the trick. Of course he gives us some pot. Skipping ahead, we face off against Tina. Like Jono, the game refers to her as Tina's second in free duel. She also boasts a vastly improved deck than before, but she still isn't as strong as Jono. Her drop table when we unlock her in Friedel is only 19 cards. That's right, 19 cards, all of which are absolute garbage. I don't think there was actually any reason to even grant her a second deck. There is nothing she drops in that table that is unique to her, and the drop rates for whatever she drops isn't any better than any of the other opponents you can farm these cards off. To put things in perspective, the strongest physical attacking card she drops is Ancient Jar, with 400 attack and 200 defense. From the spell and trap perspective, all of them are available in the starting deck, except for Dark Piercing Light, Final Flame, and I think uh, House of Adhesive Dape. She also drops Revival of Skeleton Rider if you really want the ritual card for Doku Rider. But yeah, she is garbage. I seem to be having a hard time against the pillar because I bricked. I drew an absolutely horrible hand and have made her out to be someone stronger than she actually is. She's not. <laughs> She's absolutely garbage, and I'm quite frankly ashamed that I struggled this much against her. I'm rambling on, as you can tell, just trying to play down the clock, but really there's nothing much to write home about. She's got no defensive spell and traps, so you're not going to cop a Raigeki, <laughs> except we decide to use one against her. And yeah, I think I've reached the end of my rant, blah 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 blah, we win Ancient Jar. There we go, strongest card. Tina's down, yay, and we go outside and save our game because I am not sitting through that entire freaking cutscene and series of doors again. Oh, as a bonus step, we have to always select that we want the card shop each time we want to save our game. So, you know, have fun having that extra button press for absolutely no reason. Okay, time to serious the heck up. There are seven mages to beat, and the first two I want to target are the Desert Mage and the Meadow Mage. Each mage has a deck theme, and start the duel off with a pre late field spell to suit their deck. Taking the easy way out, we kick things off with a Desert Mage, whose field spell is Wasteland. That works to our benefit. The best card in this deck, ironically, is Brachioratus, the strongest dinosaur card that we're aiming for. For some bizarre reason, neither him nor High Mage Martis drop it. We instead will have to farm that from Meadow Mage, alongside Practical, the next best dinosaur card. When we defeat the Meadow Mage, sorry, the Meadow Mage, the Desert Mage, it opens him up in Free Duel. This allows us to farm both Sword Arm of Dragon and Megazawa, two of the four remaining dinosaur cards on our list. There we go, timed perfectly, we defeat the Desert Mage and get a Mushroom Man. Onwards to High Mage Martis. The High Mages are a massive step up from the Lower Mages. You'll start encountering monsters ranging between 2500 attack points to 3250 attack points a bit more consistently than normal. Martis' strongest card is still Braco Radius, Braco Radius, Braco Radius, and Great Mammoth of Goldfine. They're both powered by Wasteland to land at about 2700 attack points. If the field spell happens to be removed during the duel, he will retaliate with Zoa at 2600 attack points and either a Dark Magician, Summon Skull, or Kazajin. Be sure to remember as well though, that Labyrinth Walls are a thing in this game. I again, forgot that they exist. And they are also further boosted by Wasteland, just to slow us down that little bit further. Defeating Mardis, on the other hand, doesn't grant us anything special. You'll find that most of the great cards we're looking for for this game, and just in general from your playthroughs, will be collected from the lower mages. We're rambling on again, because there isn't much to say from this duel. Raigeki for the win, attack, and we're done. Da -da -da -da, we win a Dark Prisoner. I'm not allowed to have those anymore. Blah blah blah, blah. we also steal his scales. Mine first set of loot obtained. Jump cutting your head, we end up at the Meadow Shrine, up against our next opponent, the goat himself, the Meadow Mage. The gimmick of the Meadow Shrine is that every duel has Sogan pre-activated, with the mage focusing on warrior type monsters. Low Meadow Mage isn't too difficult an opponent. A common trait of all low mages is that they will almost always counter your field spell with one of their own, leaving them open for a free attack the next turn. You know, which is pretty neat. 
His biggest roadblock to you, quite literally, is his Millennium Shield, with 3500 defense points with Sogan active. Finally enough, the cards in his drop table massively outclass what's in his deck, so it makes you wonder why he didn't just chuck them in there in the first place. Anywho, defeating him unlocks him in Friedel and then starts the opportunity to farm the last two Dino cards we need, Brachioratus and Practical, albeit at a 1% drop rate for both. He also has the best odds for farming Spellbinding Circle, so we'll try that if the grind requires it. Anywho, rambling on, this is our last turn. Doesn't really have anything to counter us, Raigeki for the win, ba 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 ba. Attack with Twin Headed King Rex, and we get. Da -da 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 -da, a Horn Imp, just the one. And there we go, on to High Mage Kapura. Kapura is thick as frick and hits like a massive stick. Keeping the warrior theme going, his opening move will almost always be Gate Guardian, followed by a Black Skull Dragon, if the game really feels like slapping us silly. Kapura's drop table upon defeat almost mimics that of Kaiba, albeit at a slightly reduced odd. It compensates for it by having less cards in his drop table to pick from, which is useful to anyone playing a 15 card mod of this game. Being a high mage, he won't always change the field back to Sogan after having it changed the wasteland. Instead, he opts to drop a Black Skull Dragon and attack me again with a Gate Guardian. So, things are really not looking good on my end. Thinking I can either ride Geki and then lose immediately next turn, I've decided to opt for the safer option by boosting Crawling Dragon's attack points to something at least able to take out his Black Skull Dragon. Hopefully thinking that whatever he summons next turn um, will be weaker than whatever I've got on the field. Me being bad at math, I also forgot that I'm also weaker than Gate Guardian. So yeah, there's that. So with 350 life points to spare and no cards, I opt for the Raigeki and just hope that he puts a trap card down. Which he does. I got lucky. I have no idea how this has happened, but I got really lucky. With only 350 attack points left, one attack from a Gate Guardian is enough to end me. The AI, in the biggest big brain move, decides to summon something weaker than my Urabi and attack right into it. I have no idea why it does this, but I've seen it happen before and I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I attack for game and I somehow scrape through this with a win against High Mage Kapura. Let's tore the mages down and we get a Ryukushin. Uh uh. And we steal his eye. And there we go, we save our game because I'm not going through all that again. Given that shaky duel we had against Kapura, I think it's time to grind for our last four dinosaur cards. We'll first need to duel the Desert Mage and attain at least an A power rank for him to drop both Sword Arm of Dragon and Mega Zowla. Next, we'll challenge Meadow Mage and attain either an B, C, or D rank. Tech will power anything, doesn't matter. That will get him to drop Practical, followed by us getting an A power rank to get Braco Raidus. Those two cards are both at a 1% drop rate, so for the sake of this video, I'll just jump cut to our updated deck. And there we go. Not much to say. We've just substituted our weaker dinos for our stronger dinos. And kept the rest of the equip cards that they're all compatible with. Anywho, back to the game. Keeping in line with our last rule, we'll be dueling every opponent this game has to offer us. That includes the sneaky Seto second. Getting back to the story, Tina has been kidnapped, and our Westy bestie Jono is going to help us chase after her. In pursuit, we come up against the Labyrinth Mage, who seems to have great difficulty in knowing where his nose is. Anywho, let's get into a card game. Labyrinth Mage is a small step down from the High Mages in terms of difficulty. He does throw out some challenging cards if you're not prepared for it. His strongest monster is Gate Guardian, followed by Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. If he wants to stall you, he will also throw out a Labyrinth Wall and beef it with Magical Labyrinth. My revamp deck is facing a bit of a small issue being the balance of monsters with their compatible equipped cards. This might be the time where we will start having to drop some of our stronger dino monsters in favour of those that have more equipped card compatibility. Unless we eventually give in and load ourselves up with bright castles and mega morphs. As an opponent in Freedor, it doesn't drop any useful cards. Being Magical Trap, given that we're playing with a straight dino deck. For a casual player however, he is the earliest person you can farm to inherit Thunder Dragon from, aside from Hyshun 1. Well let's face it, who's going to attempt to S-Power a Hyshun 1 from the start of the game? That's right, nobody. Anywho, getting back to the duel, we throw out a Wasteland just to give ourselves a bit of a chance, again forgetting that it powers up Rock-type monsters. When will I learn? Sadly never. You've probably noticed that I'm rambling again. This is going to be a common theme as we come up against the longer duels. I think what I might do is either jump cut the duel to the last turn, which I don't think people want to see, or I'll increase the speed of the clip. Right now we're at 200%, but who knows, maybe chucking it at 300% will make things go a bit faster. Yeah, that'll give everyone motion sickness. Anyways, Rageki for the win, and we win... Da -da 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 -da. Summoner in the Darkness. I read that card wrong. Anyways, 
Right, right, left, right is the code. And I guessed that on my first turn of this game. Anywho, back to the story. We bust in on Seto and a pimp named Jafar trying to recruit Tina. Everyone throws out their best CD face impression, which rolls us into wanting to assert our dominance again in a card game. Seto second is a notable improvement over um himself. Yeah, himself, I guess we'll go with that. His deck power is slightly stronger than that of the high mages, having access to Gate Guardian, Media Black Dragon, and a bunch of other 3000 attackish monsters. We're starting to get to the point where we'll need a hand of at least 4 equipped cards to survive some of these stronger hitters. Fortunately this fight went down without too much trouble. Seto's second's drop table doesn't have anything noteworthy for us to target. He does have access to a decent set of spell and trap cards, but the drop rates aren't all that better compared to the easier opponents who can grind them off. Anywho, rambling aside, we're down to almost our final turn, and it's starting to become abundantly clear that our duels are going to take a little bit longer to finish than we initially envisioned. A lot of the good cards that we've managed to grind from our other opponents, though they have great attack, are a bit limited in the equip cards that they are compatible with. So, as we get to some of the more stronger opponents in the final six, we might have to rejig our deck again. Anyways, Raigeki for the win, and attack for game. Da -da 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 -da, we get a Celtic Guardian. Okay, Seto second is down, Tina is rescued, and Jono is still fried as frick. And now, let's get back to the action with slapping some of our mages. First up on the chopping block, we'll be saving our game. Blah 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 blah, like I mentioned, have to click on the card shop to save our game. Anyways. Where were we? Yep, slapping some mages. Jumping into the forest shrine, we encounter the forest mage. The forest mage is trivial after the last duel we had. Noticeably, the field has been changed to forest to suit the theme and to give his monsters a small boost. I wonder how many times we can say forest in this sentence. Well, there's one more to add to the list. Anyways. His strongest card is a boosted Dry Goomer at 2700 attack points. His drop table after beating him is absolute garbage. There is nothing noticeable that he can actually drop for you. Um, he is crap. I made the mistake early on of thinking that he was the Meadow Mage when I first played this game and wasted a lot of hours dueling him for some good cards. Anyways, he is the Liquid Snake or the Meadow Mage, threatening but overall failed by design. There's nothing he can really do to stop us <laughs> other than play some things in defense mode. Ugh. As I mentioned, starting to get a bit constrained with the equip cards. Anywho, so we can speed things along, I decide to play with the AI by changing the field, forcing him the next turn to go revert it back to forest and leaving nothing on his side to defend against me. See, like I said, the AI will almost always do this, it's like they have a permanent forest in their hand. Anyways, attack for game and we get nothing. What do we get? Forest. There we go. Useless. Low mage done. Now over to High Mage and Abyssius. And Abyssius' deck is geared towards almost always summoning a perfectly ultimate Great Moth against you. And with Forest on the field, it gets an additional boost, leaving it at 4000 attack points. This means that we'll need 5 equip cards to be able to hit over it, or have at least a Wasteland of our own activated to negate its stat boost. Alternatively, we can rely on simple dumb luck to draw Regeki as an out, which you'll start seeing me do a bit more frequently from this point on. Anyways. Anubisius' drop table on defeat is just as bad as his lower mage counterpart. Strangely, both him and Weevil Underwood are the only two opponents in the game who drop Eradicating Aerosol, the literal counter to all insect monsters. Shame none of the opponents face from this point on use it, aside from Nightmare and maybe Hyshin. I think that was it. Ah, oh, there we go, look at that, he's boosted it up. So much for that. Anyways, I'm not looking too good. <laughs> so... We only have 4 of the 5 needed equip cards to get over Great Moth, but fortunately we had Mega Lazawa in our hand, who has a bit higher defense than his attack. Putting him in defense mode is just enough to hang on for the next turn. Hopefully it won't take too much longer. After a lot of hesitation I contemplate using Raigeki, which I think is a no brainer move at this point. I keep forgetting that none of the high mages have any trap cards to disrupt you. It's when you start getting to the final 6 that they'll start laying widespread ruin and acid trap hole as counters to your strong monsters. So for now, I think I'm going to have to play this as a bit of stall, leaving a weaker monster in attack mode to bait him into an attack, and then attacking over it for game. Rambling as usual. Another Raigeki? Nope. Let's just drop another practical. And yeah, that's it. We have enough to take him out. Da -da -da -da. What do we get? Skata, a basic insect. And that's it. That's Anabesius is down. And we still his key. Yoink. Two more mages to go. We skip ahead to the Ocean Mage. Gimmick, as you would have guessed, is that the field spell is Umi. Umi powers up all Aqua Monsters and Thunder Monsters, whilst lowering the attack of all Pyro and Machine types. 
The Ocean Mage, like all other lower mages, isn't too tough. He does have the ability to fuse into Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, which with this field will be boosted to 3300 attack points, but other than that, this duel is basically free. Ocean Mage's drop table is only handy if you're looking to farm the strongest Sea Serpent and Aqua type monsters. Handy to know for later, but it's useless for this playthrough. He does drop Eternal Drought, if you really need a water specific Raigeki for some odd reason, but honestly by the time you get to High Mage Segmenton, I'm pretty sure you'll find a way around him without much trouble. Anywho, I draw absolutely pathetic cards, so I'm primarily just going to be dealing with a bit of chip damage back and forth with this guy. No, no Raigeki for the win, that's okay. This duel is over, without much trouble, attack, and attack for game, that's it. Da -da 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 -da. We win the Fiend Kraken. Okay, on to High Mage. So this discount Poseidon Aquaman reject is Segmenton. I have no idea why he had lines on his body armor, so I'll skip trying to comprehend that. I brick in my starting hand which is no surprise. I'm also getting a bit forgetful in remembering what equip cards go with which monster. So yeah, this makes my life easy. Not. Anyways, Segmenton has the strongest card in the entire game. Completely undefeatable by its sheer awesomeness. If we encounter this card, we end the run. Of course, I'm talking about Crab Turtle. Fortunately for us, he does not summon it. Anyways, Segmenton is a cakewalk. His drop table is utterly useless to us given that it has low percent odds for any useful cards we could gain from it, and he doesn't drop anything useful to us at this point of the game that can't already be dropped from anyone before him. I guess the one redeeming thing about him is that he uses the field spell Umi, and it gives you a very nice blue color. Blue is my favorite color. I like looking at this field. It brings me joy. As you can tell, I'm still rambling, but I like the blue. Blue's favorite. Cool, last turn. Come on, let's bring it home. Bam, bam, and bam. And we attack for game. There we go, and he drops for us. Da 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 da. A Lady of Faith. And there we go, that's Sekmenton down. And we steal his necklace. Yoink. Okay, on to the last shrine and against our last lower mage. Here we have the mountain mage, whose field spell is, yes, you guessed it, mountain. Low mage is geared towards trying to bring out wing beast and dragon type monsters, with his go-to being crimson sunbird and twin headed thunder dragon if he happens to get a good hand. When you defeat him, his drop table isn't really too bad. Though it's filled with mostly ritual cards, he also has a few handy recovery spells you can farm, from a relatively easy opponent at that. He also has a 0.1% chance of dropping Media Black Dragon. So yeah, take those odds as you will. He's also the only duelist outside of the final six who drops Dian Keta the Cure Master. I've personally never used that card, so I cannot attest to its utility. But with a card that gives you a 5,000 life point boost, that's always a plus. So you know, no complaints there. Anywho, I start getting complacent and genuinely forgetting how strong his monsters actually get when they're boosted by Mountain. But it doesn't matter, I'm on to my final turn, and we attack for game. There we go, and we win... Da -da 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 -da. Legul. Mountain Mage is done, on to High Major Tenza. The final mage of our playthrough, finally, it's good old Snoop Mage. Snoop Mage's deck is a noticeable boost from his predecessor. On his first turn, he'll more often than not summon either a Black Skull Dragon, or fuse into Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. He also has the slight chance of dropping a Meteor Black Dragon on us, which will sit at a 4,000 attack point being boosted by Mountain. Not fun. If you're backed into that corner, a field spell change or a handy Raigeki is all that's really needed to flip the scales on this high cargo. Anyways, his drop table is somewhat repeated with Kapuras. He holds useful cards in his tech table, but the drop rates at which he gives them to us aren't any better than the lower duels you can get them from. On the power side, however, he has probably the best odds for dropping Wing Beast type monsters, which we'll keep in mind when I eventually start the Wing Beast run. Anyways, back to the duel, what's going on here? Sayoru, oh yeah, forgot about him. Anyways, we start bricking with respect to some of our equip cards, which as I mentioned is going to become a problem later. I'm also being a bit cautious with regards to his back row because he does have an Acid Trap Hole in his deck. Acid Trap Hole obviously destroys any monster that's at 3000 attack points or less. Alright, so practically, <laughs> there we go. We're going to just chip away at him with some lower monsters and just bait him into attacking whatever we have on the field. There we go. Serpent Nine Dragon. There isn't really much to say. Um, 
being cautious again, I drop a Wasteland because I'm more than likely expecting him to drop a Black Skull Dragon or a Media Black Dragon. But alas, he does not. Anywho, on to our last turn. I sit there debating whether I should drop a Raigeki or a Brachioradius. Don't know why I didn't just use a Raigeki. I'm a bit slow. You've realised that by now. Anywho, we win Taihon. Just the one, not the two. And that's it. Snoop Mage is down and we steal his necklace. Seto slides into our DMs and tells us to meet him at the Var Shrine. Thankfully, we don't need to navigate the maze a second time since we already did it on our way to Seto too. Anyways, Cheeky Sneaky Boy over here opens the back door for us and we get to start our first encounter with a final six. Up ahead, we meet Jar Jar Binks and Harvey Birdman. It is now that I realise that I should have saved my game before going through this, but oh well, how bad could things be? Damn son, are you a construction company? Cause you friggin bricked. Really regret that I didn't save. I brick on my first hand and have the pleasure of sitting there witnessing Metal Zoa attack my life points directly again and again. This is the punishment I get for a bad play, so I'm not confident that I'm going to be able to make it much further than this. I play defensively, hoping I can draw a decent monster compatible with my equip cards as an out. But instead, I end up wasting two Raigekis just to take out one Metal Zoa. And how does our fantabulous friend respond to that? Fuses into another Metal Zoa. Isn't that great? So, I'm clearly on the back foot, and I still do not have any equip cards that I can fuse into. So in a last ditch effort, I put the only equip card that's compatible with all my dinos, and hope that he doesn't summon anything. <laughs> We're not looking good at all. Wasting another Raigeki, we take out the other Metal Zoa. Let's see how he responds. Not we good, three traps. Finally, I have a dino card, but unfortunately I'm starting to run into some trouble. My equip card's simply incompatible with enough of my monsters. Anywho. Having over 3,200 attack points, I feel safe in that I won't be done up by Acid Trap Hole. This is probably the most ideal hand I can have. Megala Zawa and another 4 equip cards. With that done, I think we can attack the game. I lied. <laughs> I forgot how... I was misreading the life points, turns out I was on 2,000 and not him. But anyways, as we said, just as a precaution I'm going to change the field to Wasteland and attack him for game. Third, how many Metal Zoas does this guy have? Anywho, that is Sebek Jar Jar Binks, whatever you want to call him down, and we get an Ancient Tool. On to Harvey Birdman. Duelist that law. I wish I could say that I went through this duel without too much trouble, but I'd be lying if I did. In fact, I'd be lying if I said that I won this duel at all. The duel that you're watching now on screen, I ended up losing. I bricked in almost all my hands that I drew against Neku, which ended up giving him the win. I ran through this gauntlet several times, beating Sebek without a problem, but having to brick again against Neku. I was struggling to even beat over a 3000 attack Dark Magician, something that should be child's play for something this late in the game. On my third run, I did end up making it to Hessian. He did, however, humble me with a loss. On my fourth run, by some sheer fluke, I made it all the way to Seto Third, who proceeded to utterly decimate me with his triple blue eyes ultimate dragons. I hadn't been able to make it to him since. It is possible to make it further, however I'd be strictly reliant on bad AI from multiple opponents letting me set up my own equip cards. In addition, I'd be hoping that they wouldn't set up any of their own. If card luck was enough of a win condition, Exodia decks would be the desired deck for the final six. Yet they aren't. It's time to go back and grind for all those cards that I've been putting off. First things first, we want to target the low hanging fruit. Bleep, Kaiba and Simon drop widespread ruin, acid trap hole and fake trap at any B, C or D rank. The one that will actually make it to our deck is Widespread Ruin. The other two are just there to assist with us s taking our next round of opponents. There are two ways we can s take an opponent. First and the most time consuming way is to have the opponent deck out. That will always be a guaranteed s tech. The second, faster but yet more convoluted method is to complete a duel with the following conditions. Consume 9 or more turns. Use 5 face down cards. 5 equip cards. 1 magic card. 7 traps having between 1 and 7,000 life points and using 15 or more cards in a duel. It can be simplified to use less cards as this process, but the above is idiot proof. With that strat, we have the long arduous task of applying it to farm the rest of these cards. Pegasus is our main target, with Megamorph being the key card needed to unblock us. The rest are a bonus. Through the power of anything, let's jump cut to our newly constructed deck. Alright, here's our new deck. Truthfully all we did was slide in a Megamorph and a Bright Castle to help with our equipped bricks. Other than that, Harpy's Feather Duster, Spellbinding Circle, and a Widespread Ruin just for safety. Back to our favourite love chums, we're speeding through the first round of all the opponents we take on. 
We're up against Jar Jar Binks. He's not much trouble. So long as I can summon a monster with over 3000 attack, he goes down without much of a fight. I'm still finding that the balance in my hands are a little off. I'm fortunate in that I happen to get a decent hand with Crawling Dragon and a bunch of other equip cards. So with this setup, I'm now able to steamroll him. I've tried to up the video speeds to about 300% to speed through these duels, but unfortunately it's not making much of a difference. The fun part is, I get to boost my monsters over well <laughs> over, well over 6,000 attack. And Raigeki for the win, yes, there we go. Jar Jar Binks is down, it doesn't matter what he gives us. Dragon Zombie, fun stuff. Now we're up against Harvey Birdman. Duelist at Law and one of our earlier roadblocks from the last deck we had put together. His deck is nearly identical to Sebex in that his strongest monster will always be 3000 attack. The difference is, it will be Dark Magician instead of Metal Zoa. What he can do is use Dark Energy on Dark Magician, but again, doesn't matter. I'm waffling along, I'm just trying to speed things up. The strategy that I'm going to start having to employ with a lot of these other duelists is summoning something weaker, either baiting them to attack it, or attacking into something stronger than myself so I can pop one of their trap cards. And believe me, there's going to be a lot of that happening in the later duels. Anywho, my hand is looking absolutely shite, so we fuse ourselves a shadow spell and see if we can make a difference here. Anyways, waffling aside onto our last turn. Practical, attack, attack, and down goes Harvey Neku Birdman. Da -da -da -da, we win Reaper of the Cards. Fun stuff. Onto our favorite person, a pimp named Jafar. Jafar's deck is nearly identical to what he had at the start of the game, barring the replacement of his Cosmo Queen with a Blue Eyes White Dragon and a Metal Zoa. He also has included a Gate Guardian to keep up with the current power creep. You're going to start seeing me pause and reshuffle my cards a few times. Nothing wrong with me, save for the bad dueling. I simply recorded this bit of gameplay during lunch, and was stuffing down some yum yums at the time. Anyways, I'm wary that Haishin likes to leave down some widespread ruins. So having only one monster on the field, I'm cautious that he's going to take it out with one of those. So in the closest thing I have to a big brain move, I'm going to try bait out his other traps by attacking him to him with a weaker monster. That's unless I draw a Harpy's Feather Duster. Sucks to be you, Jafar. I shouldn't celebrate too early. Despite what he has going on in the field, he still has a 3% chance of drawing an Exodia piece, so it's entirely possible he could obliviate our sad existence. But then I remember that we're Rex. We're basically the main character of this game, so we can't lose. So with that being said, we do what we do best. Raigeki for the win, and Jafar goes down. Da -da 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 we win... Gemini Elf. Stalking us like some sort of Tsundere crack addict, Sato is back, and he whips out his magic rod. Impressed by this, we follow him back to the pentagram in the sky, where he shows us his magic wall, which is revealed to be a secret base stadium stolen from the BBA. Confronting us for the last time, we're dragged into a duel with Seto 3. Seto 3 is considered the hardest duelist in the game, despite not being the final boss. This is due to his deck having the highest odds of summoning Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, Gate Guardian, and Media Black Dragon. On top of this, he has a 6% chance each turn to either use a Raigeki or Shadow Spell on us. The last time we faced off against Seto 3, he summoned 3 of his Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragons on us, which we simply couldn't beat over without needing at least 2 turns of setup. Anyways, we start our first 3 turns like we always do, by having a complete brick house of a hand, coupled with the annoyance of me forgetting once more what equip cards go with which monster. Seriously, it's like I'm playing a game of gin. Finally summoning something, I also learned that I can't math too good either since I'm still short of 3000 attack points needed to beat over his blue eyes white dragon. Coming to a sudden realization, I feel like I've had an ultimate slap to the face. I think that I did better against Seto 3 with my old deck versus this new one. Had I had the run that I'm having right now, I certainly would have won our last duel and made it to the final boss. But alas, what can you do? I put in all those hours of grinding and I'm sure as hell gonna use them. Figuring out that 1 plus 1 equals 2, I finally summoned something strong enough to take out his blue eyes white dragon. Took me long enough, Megamorph at least comes in handy. So I guess all that grinding wasn't a complete loss. Anyways, with the RNG god smiling on us, we win our duel again using our magic Raigeki. Hands down our MVP of this run. Da -da 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 we win, Kamikari man. Anyway, the gang gives us a decision to smash or pass, which is rudely interrupted by Jafar asking us to play a game of knifey spoony. Not wanting to miss out on the fun, the base stadium decides to throw a flashbang at us which reveals the presence of the Nigerian prince who wants to bequeath us his entire fortune of riches. Oh, he also turns Jafar into a card and sets him on fire. Classic banter. Anyway, we flex on the prince with our own riches, showing off our Visa Kid cards that we scam from Yugi. This angers the Nigerian royal who challenges us to a duel. The Nigerian prince's deck is fortunately weaker than Haishin's. His strongest monster is Media Black Dragon at 3500 attack points, followed by Black Skull Dragon at 3200 attack points. The key gimmick he likes to spring on you is Reverse Trap. Reverse Traps nullify any equipped card that increases your monster's attack points, 
and converts that power up into a power reduction, reducing their attack points instead. Not fun for us, as this is literally our bread and butter to beat this game. Like a bolt from the blue, it's time for Reaper review, and our hand has bricked again. No surprise to us. Fortunately, I think we've exhausted this guy, as he's now just throwing out basic cards that stand no real challenge to us. They're about as strong as the mages we've come up against. It's a joke, really. A single boosted Broker Radius is enough to really take him down. And to be fair, if things get dicey, we do have about two Raigekis in our hand. Well, I guess one now. Ah, oh, there we go. There's a Blue Eyes. That's not fun. But like I said, not much to deal with. We have enough equip cards to boost ourselves enough to take him down. And there we go. There's another attack into his strongest monster. He doesn't throw out any traps that can pose a problem to us, so I'm not too worried about Widespread Run. The thing is, is that I forgot about this. That's why this duel took longer than it should have. Anywho, attack for game. Da -da 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 -da, we got a Blue Wing Crown. In an absolute rage quick moment, he throws another flashbang at us and he transforms into Nightmare, the final boss of this game, who's still weaker than Seto 3. Nightmare's deck is a good deal stronger than his previous opponent, despite them being the same person. I have no idea why he didn't just use this deck from the get-go, but whatever. Plot holes aside, Nightmare's strongest card is Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon, followed by Gate Guardian. He also has both a media Black Dragon and Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth at 3500 attack points. Strangely, his deck has no spell and trap cards, so... He really has nothing that can counter us if we overpower him. He does adopt the never fail strategy of summoning a twin headed Thunder Dragon, which doesn't really do too much against us given that it's, you know, weaker than us and has no equip cards. So we attack over his monsters and we're looking pretty comfortable for a final opponent. Digressing in my intelligence, I think that I can attack for the win by using a Raigeki. Sadly I'm 200 attack points short, which is not that big of a deal. We have enough cards in our hands to really take him out for good, and with what better way to do so than with a signature Braco Raidus. Nightmare down, we get Eldeen, and that's our final boss defeated, and we have won. Sitting on our throne like the king that we are, it is possible to beat Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories using only dinosaur monsters. Hey everyone, Jono here. Thank you all so much for watching this video. This is a new series I'm looking to start where I'll be going through this challenge for all 20 monster types contained within this game. Comment below what type you'd like to see next. While you're at it, it would be super awesome if you could like, share and subscribe to the channel. You'll find tons of things in there, like other challenge runs, speed runs, and uploads of my Twitch VODs for those of you that follow me on there. As I don't post often, be sure to hit the bell icon to be notified each time a new video is released. But till then, stay awesome people, and I'll catch you next time.